In this episode of Mind Pump, we talk all about a condition that is actually terrible for your health. It actually might be the worst condition to be in. This is the low muscle, weak, high body fat condition known as skinny fat. Skinny so fat. This is when your body weight is normal or actually maybe low, but you don't have much muscle. And remember, muscle has protective effects on the body. And as a result, you have a high body fat percentage. In other words, the amount of body fat that you carry is a high percentage yeah. of your the body The majority weight. of you is dough. Now, in this episode, we talk about what that looks like, what it means, what the risk factors are. And then we give you three ways to remedy this. So if this is you, we give you three concrete ways to reverse this in yourself so that you're no longer skinny fat. Now, before the episode begins, I want to remind everybody that this month, MAPS Aesthetic is 50% off all month long. MAPS Aesthetic is our workout program designed to get help you sculpt, shape, and build your body how you see fit. It's the only MAPS program where you can go and follow the workouts, but then add components specific to your body. So let's say you're somebody who wants to build more glute muscles or maybe you want to build more chest muscles. You can actually incorporate those into your focus sessions in the program to bring up those lagging body parts. It's the one program that allows you to sculpt your body like a sculptor. Again, it's 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsblack.com and use the code BLACK50. B-L-A-C-K-5-0, no space for the discount. One of the more difficult things to um, to identify in terms of like how healthy people are, because it's a, it's, a, it's, a it's a tough thing when you're talking about looking at the general population. It's we're using things... We're using yeah. things like uh, BMI. I like Duff's. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> uh, we're using things like BMI, right? Um, people's total body weight. But we know as trainers that that's not always accurate. In fact, sometimes people have a great BMI, uh, but they have very, very bad or, or, or terrible health. Skinny and, fat people. It, right. And you're starting to see skinny fat being talked about now in the medical community. Uh, they're actually finding that people who have low body weight – but high percentages of body fat to have some of the worst health of all. I used to tell my clients that the my clients that I would measure high body fat and you could see they were they were discouraged because they're they're overweight by 30 40 pounds. I used to tell them that hey, I think you're in a better place than some of these clients that I measure that you would think they're in good shape by the way they look because they're it's very deceptive because, because they're that. skinny, yeah. but they have really high body fat percentage. I said because your body expresses and shows and tells you when you're you're off and you're not doing well, and that encourages you to make better food choices and, and begin exercising like you're doing here at the gym versus some of these people that, and the ones I'll tell you that I experienced the most as a trainer were uh, my uh, models and people in, in, that, in that industry that were always extreme dieting to fit in a category. I need to be this weight in order mm -hmm. to have these contracts. And they actually did little to mm -hmm. no exercise. And so they looked thin, but when I would measure their body fat, they would uh, uh, read really high. Yeah, and a lot of people are like, how is that possible? How can someone be skinny but have a, have a lot of body fat? So when it comes to body fat, it's not necessarily the amount of body fat you have in your body. It's whether or not it makes up a large percentage yeah. of your overall body weight. So you could be a 100-pound person, but you could have 30 pounds of body fat on your body, in which case it would be 30% body fat, which is considered really high. So really, your body weight, you know, to some extent makes a difference. It matters. But the percentage of your body weight that's body fat makes a bigger difference. And here's why being skinny fat oftentimes is actually worse than just being overweight. Somebody who's just overweight may have enough muscle to help offset some of the negatives of the high of the high amount of body fat. Somebody who's skinny fat has the dual problem of high body fat percentage and lack of muscle. Mm -hmm. So they can't make up for the metabolic effects of high body fat with some muscle. So they have the dual effect, low muscle, high body fat, that can cause some, some serious problems. Um, you see this, now oftentimes this is expressed in skinny fat people with, so let, let's say you don't get a body fat test. How would you know that you're skinny fat? Um, how are you weak? You know, if you're at a low body weight, but you're also very, very weak, you can't do a single push up, um, or you have you struggle, you know, lifting grocery bags or carrying a backpack for 
you know, longer than you know, 20 or 30 yards, um, there's a sign right there that you may be skinny fat. Do you store body fat in uh, uh, abnormal amounts around your belly? Oftentimes you'll find people in the skinny fat category where they have skinny arms, skinny legs, mm. but they'll store kind of more around the belly area. And they also tend to store more visceral body fat, which is the body fat uh, that's around uh, the organs. Mm-hmm. Now, from a you know from a from a health perspective, somebody who's skinny fat oftentimes will have will display some poor health markers, just like somebody who's overweight. Oftentimes, they'll have high blood sugar or blood sugar issues. And people who are skinny fat get surprised about this. You know, they go to the doctor and they're thirty five or forty years old. And their body weight is good. They're within BMI, maybe lower than 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 BMI normal or whatever. They get tested, and the doctor's like, "Oh, you're borderline." Well, that's what I think so dangerous about it because I have a lot of friends like this, and even like family members who, uh, you know, can maintain a certain body weight. And so that's that's their entire thought process is like, if I maintain this weight and I keep eating the way I'm eating, and I, you know, have moderate activity, like I'm going to be just fine and the doctor says I'm just fine because what they're reading off of is this BMI chart and meanwhile like they're not considering uh, you know all these ramifications down the road because of what you know is going on internally and you know all the potential risks for all these other diseases you know because their uh, poor health is underneath the surface. Well you have to talk a little bit more Sal about visceral fat versus subcutaneous fat and how how our body stores that differently like explain that and and how that varies from from people like uh, some people, uh, I know genetically uh, would store more uh, viscerally than others, and then also I think uh, eating behaviors can cause that too, right? Yeah, excessive dieting, um, on-off dieting, uh, yeah. low activity Yo-yoing. levels. Yeah, uh, you tend to store more visceral body fat, which is the body fat that's around organs. It's more inflammatory. It can cause more problems and health problems um, for the body. Um, and it, visceral body fat is more is the is if you want to call fat good and bad, that's more on the bad side. And people who are skinny fat, low body weight, high fat, low muscle, tend to have more of this visceral body fat. In fact, skinny fat people, uh, people who have low BMI but high body fat percentage, have some of the worst life expectancy numbers. A lot of people don't realize that when you look at people who have the worst outcomes, it tends to be people who are underweight but also weak with little muscle. So it's not like you're underweight, but you're lean. You're underweight with a high percentage of body fat, especially as you age. In fact, body weight, low BMI is not a good thing for people as they age because of the lack of muscle. Muscle has a very protective effect on the body. Mm-hmm. And if you're just low weight, you know, if you're a 30, 40-year-old, underweight, not a lot of muscle, you're going to be a frail and weak, sick, older person if you don't start to remedy that and start to work on that. Do you think there's any correlation with this person? Um, and I had a, a handful of a handful of clients I had like this. I even uh, dated a couple of girls that ate like this where they would like graze on, you know, baby carrots, you know, mm-hmm. all day long for a week and eating low calorie, 800 calories a day. But then on Friday or Saturday night, they would go out and they would party and, you know, drink seven, eight drinks, which would contribute to, you know, 2,000 calories coming from alcohol and sugar in in that evening. Do you think that that, that person is someone who would uh, more commonly have a higher uh, visceral body fat? Totally, because what they're doing is they're people who are skinny fat live a lifestyle that encourages low body weight but also discourages muscle growth, right? So skinny fat people tend to have a diet that's low in protein and low in calories. Mm-hmm. So they're eating, and you know, I blame some of the low fat hysteria that we had in the 80s, 90s, and even early 2000s where everything's low fat. So they're eating things like crackers and rice cakes. And like you said, Adam, you know, baby carrots here and there. The calories are really low. Their protein intake is extremely low, which low protein intake um, can definitely contribute to less muscle. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, of course, calories from alcohol. Alcohol calories have almost no (laughs) positive impact (laughs) on the body. nutrients there. In fact, lots of alcohol, regardless of diet and resistance training, um, has been shown to reduce muscle mass. In fact, what ends up happening with these people, and you probably, you know exactly, as soon as I explain this, people will know. They'll be like, oh, I know people who look like that. As people who are skinny fat start to age, they start to get that apple shape. Mm. where they might gain a little weight, but it's all in the midsection. Right. Arms and legs stay, stay, stay really, really skinny. 
this shape in particular for women tends to be associated with really poor health. Now, is it fair to also kind of assume to, I, I've met a lot of, you know, this, this type of uh, avatar that we're talking about where the preference being, if I'm going to get activity, it's going to be more cardiovascular driven. Like that's something I've known, even like, for instance, for my brother, like he's a, uh, he's a tall guy, he's, he's skinny, but, uh, does not lift weights is not, uh, you know, something in his regiment where he's, he's more prone to playing basketball, walking, running, but mm -hmm. it just avoids like, uh, you know, late weightlifting in general. Yeah. Mo most skinny fat people have low activity, right? So low activity, low calories, low protein. But then you find people who the, they do activity, but they navigate, uh, or they gravitate, I should say towards long steady state type cardio, long duration type cardiovascular activity. These are people who are skinny fat because they're afraid of the scale, right? They're afraid of gaining any weight at all. And they want to do the form of exercise that they think is going to burn the most calories and burn the most body fat. Right. We see these people in the gym. They would come in, they'd get on the elliptical and they'd be there for an hour and then they'd be out. And you would, and you would, you know, when you do your, your free body fat table, every once in a while they come by, you test their body fat and you blow them away that their body fat percentage was, you know, 32%. Like I do an hour of cardio or two hours of cardio every single day. Yeah, I, would I think just find that goes hand in hand because of the hysteria over the weight. Like I don't, totally. I don't want to get too much weight, so therefore, yeah, like the bulkiness and all those myths that are, are surrounding that, uh, you know, that mentality. You t you tend to see that a lot more. I feel like they would be the most vulnerable too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you are there. You know, there's an RDA for all of our nutrients, right? That our body needs on a, on a regular basis, and if you are skinny fat, more likely than not, you're you're under eating and you're probably missing a lot of macro and micronutrient targets. Yeah, very undernourished. Uh, and so I would think too, these people are the most susceptible to getting, you know, sick and catching disease and things like that because they are so malnutrition. And in potentially also exercising, like you're making the point of doing cardio and things like that, but then not feeding their body enough nutrients to build any sort of muscle. Um, it probably uh, in a worse state than that person who's yeah. carrying 30, 40 pounds of extra body fat. On. In my in my experience, skinny fat clients had either there were either there were two general categories of uh, how they would present themselves. Besides the obvious high body fat percentage, low body weight, one would be the low energy skinny fat person. This person just had low energy, a bit listless. We'd go start our first workout, and it was like. Fatigue five, immediately. Fatigue, yeah. five pounds. They're and just you, you know what I'm. You, I, I think you can picture that, right? The mm -hmm. other skinny fat person that I would often work with was the wired, yeah. overstressed and, individual. Yes, yeah. overstressed, wired, and tired yep. skinny fat person. This is the person that's high strung, eyes usually big, uh, hair. Typically, your type A kind of person. Type A hair yeah. doesn't look healthy. Skin typically doesn't look healthy. Go go go. Maybe they're uh, you know either. Uh, a man who's just, you know, has no time for anything but work or whatever, or a woman the same way, or a mom. Oftentimes, this would be a mom who all she does is care about her kids, undereats, doesn't want to be overweight, so she undereats, but but she's wired because she drinks coffee all day long and she's on stimulants to try and give, give herself some energy. Those are the two types of skinny fat people out to you, either the listless, low energy, oh my God, it's like I have, I have to like push them to do anything, and the wired but tired individual those are general. Does that kind of resonate with you guys? Same thing. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And and with the overstimulated, you know, wired and tired type of skinny fat individual, they were typically uh, overtraining. Mm -hmm. If they were working out, it was too much, too often. It was like lots of cardio, lots of aerobics classes, lots like of like their body could just never catch up. That's right. You know, they never like really like allowed themselves adequate amount of rest or, or sleep or anything to be able to kind of regenerate. Right. And the reason why this is such an important topic to talk about is because it's harder for people to recognize within themselves. I think it's easier when you're thirty or forty pounds over overweight to say, you know, I should probably, you know, work on some stuff uh, in regards to my health. But if you weigh yourself on the scale and you're like, well, I'm, I'm not I'm not heavy. My body weight's good. I'm a man. I'm 150 pounds or I'm a woman. I'm 110 pounds. You know, it's you may think to yourself, everything's OK until you might go to the doctor and get, you know, high blood sugar or get symptoms of inflammation or you just feel like crap when you finally say, OK, I think I need to improve something. It's, it's more insidious. It's harder to to identify. But, you know, if this is you, if you're body weight is low, but you feel your body and you're squishy, you're not strong, you don't have a lot of energy, or you're wired and tired, 
um, there are some remedies. This yeah. is also most most common in the in the people that are really afraid to put that muscle on. Like these, I, when I think of the clients that I had that that fell in this category, I feel like I really had to convince them to let go of this stigma of we're going to lift weights and you're going to get bulky and masculine looking. Like that was the greatest challenge for. And if someone's listening right now and you are potentially skinny fat or know somebody that is. That to me is the greatest hurdle for those people. Totally, most of them are avoiding weights in in fear of getting this bulky, muscular, manly look. And I'd have to spend at least a couple months overcoming that before I could gain their trust to actually follow what. The I advice want to do. that I give these people is the same advice I get people who are overweight but obsessed with the with with you know how they look. Take your scale, put it in the closet. Don't weigh yourself anymore. Mm -hmm. Stop weighing yourself. We're going to base your progress off of your performance yeah. and how you feel because that scale is going to be – it's going to scare you if you gain a couple pounds of muscle. It's going to scare you. I wish that strength was was more uh, revered as one of the main you know measures of health because, it, I mean, it just spans across – if we were to give somebody a one of those grip tests, for instance, like say our doctors were now would test people coming in to just see like how much – you know, force that could generate and, and see what that looked like. Like, I, I feel like that'd be such a better measure than, you know, like looking at even just their composition or, you know, their body makeup, like a lot of other markers. I would, I would revere like their strength uh, so much, so much higher. It is. In fact, they are, uh, there are studies now that show that, that when you're a, a simple grip test is a better indicator of, you know, your overall uh, longevity and health by itself than almost any other individual measure. Now, of course, when you take lots of different tests and combine them, that's the best reading. But if you were going to compare one to one, mm -hmm. a grip test, especially as people get older, they can tell like, Do oh, you, you're It's weak. like a check engine light. It's like th everything's working. Yes. Do you think we're moving in that direction? I want to believe we are. Do you guys think so? Or do you, do you feel- Slowly. I, I could see some progress. I think it's the studies, like you're mentioning, that I, really does help. It's starting to happen. I mean, I, I don't remember. I mean, obviously we didn't have things like Instagram a decade ago, but it wasn't that long ago that uh, you rarely would see uh, a girl deadlifting heavy weight and talking about her PR. Like, mm -hmm. I just, that didn't happen- uh, a decade or two ago in training. So I feel like it's becoming more popular and more accepted in, in both male and female communities that, uh, it, you know, strength is more revered than what it was, uh, you know, two decades ago. It's I think not, it's changing. And yeah. it's, it's, it's changing because it's not that it's just cool to be strong. It is cool, right? It's great to be strong and be very capable. It's very empowering. Um, but besides that, we're realizing that strength is an indicator of health. Yeah. That's, it's an investment. That's why we're starting to know if you're weak, just like if you have a lot of body fat or if you have high blood pressure, if you're weak, your health is suffering. It's probably suffering. So number one, the number one way to remedy skinny fat is to lift weights. 100% hands down, bar none. Now, the way that I would train people in this category uh, was a bit unique. Oftentimes with these people, because they're skinny fat, they have low muscle mass and low strength. I am focused entirely on just getting them stronger. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing tons of exercises and tons of angles and bodybuilding training with all these cables. I'm getting them good at the compound movements. And my best success with skinny fat people was getting them better at squatting, deadlifting, bench pressing, overhead pressing, and rowing. Like I would get them good at those exercises and the results were always absolutely phenomenal. Oh, it looked very uh, maps anabolic esque. Totally right. I mean, you, and you don't need to be training five days a week in the gym. You know, three mm -hmm. days a week in the gym is plenty. Focused on a full body routine, mainly all compound lifting, and that body's going to respond. In fact, uh, three days a week for some people. If you're listening and you're not working out, and you're like, "Wow, this is all ringing a bell with me. This is all resonating." Two days a week is probably optimal. Honest to God, that's probably optimal for you to start two days a week, go to the gym, do a full body workout where you're focusing on those compound movements and you're trying to just get stronger. As far as rep ranges are concerned, I would say focus on anything between the 1 to 12 rep range to get started. The higher rep ranges, uh, we can leave until you start to get better at those. But the reason why lifting weights is the number one thing is because the main reason why you're skinny fat is because you have no muscle. Mm -hmm. And the body does not build muscle unless it has a signal. So even if you 
eat more protein and do all these other things that you feel like are going to you know, contribute to more muscle gain. Not going to happen unless your body has a good signal. Now, you may be wondering why. Why is that the case? Muscle is expensive tissue. Muscle costs a lot of energy for your body. Body fat, not so much. Body fat, your body can gain body fat, store it. Doesn't take a lot of calories to support body fat. Muscle, well, the more muscle you have on, the, on your body, the more food you need in order to support that muscle. So your body's not about to make itself you know, require more calories unless it absolutely thinks it needs to. And what resistance training does is it sends a signal. It sends a signal because when you're in the gym lifting weights, you're, you're causing very, very minor amounts of damage on muscle. This is why sometimes you'll get sore, although I recommend you don't train until you get really sore. Try not to get too sore. That's why you might get a little sore. That damage, your body aims to heal, but then past the healing point, your body's trying to adapt so that in the future, the same insult doesn't cause the same amount of damage. Your body becomes, it has a reason to get yeah, stronger. It's overcoming its environment. So you got to introduce that environment and, and your body's going to perform to that and then uh, over that so that way you can thrive in that environment. Totally. And, and to that point too, I think it's really important for this person to track and track uh, their weight, their strength, not their body weight, right? Get rid of the scale, like Sal said, throw that away. Stop paying attention to that, but really pay attention to the amount of weight that you're lifting and then trying to stretch yourself over every workout. Because again, thinking back to the person that that was most common that had this, that had that were skinny fat or had this challenge, it's definitely that person that has that stigma around lifting weights. And if I finally got them to do a strength training program, that was the first hurdle. The next hurdle was trying to get them to increase weight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, it was already a big, a big task to get me to even convince them to go lift weight. Now I'm asking them to do five reps, yeah. you know, and let's add five pounds to the bar and let's go a little bit. I'm glad over you brought that up. You got to challenge yourself. You, you're challenging yourself to lift more and more weight with good form. So, and, and this is an important point. I'm glad you said that because I think I forget sometimes how you need to communicate this because it <laughs> sounds so obvious to us. Yeah. But oftentimes you get this client who falls in this category They'd go to the gym and they lift weights and they would do it for six months. Mm -hmm. And you'd say, "Well, tell me about your workout." Well, I always use I always use the ten pound dumbbells uh -huh. when I do rows. I always use thirty pounds when I bench press. And it's like, what do you mean you always? Well, that's just the weight that I use. Yeah. No, if you if it gets easy and you're stronger, add weight because every time you add weight and your body if you if you get stronger and you don't add weight, your body's only met the current demand. Yeah. Meaning you'll build muscle and then done. Well, and two, I think a lot of these like at home programs, like you know, a Jazzer Size or Jane Fonda, or like a video that's like easy to do. Like they didn't, they weren't real big proponents of then increasing the weight and then adding more load to you know the type of train. Totally different mentality. So I just don't think you know that that type of mentality is is something that's common for this type of person. Yes, get stronger. That's your best measure. Go to the gym, lift weights. Focus on free weights. I'll recommend that right now. Machines are okay. There's nothing necessarily wrong with machines. They just don't do as good of a job at fitting your body, fitting the way you bought your the way you move, depending on you know, regardless of your shape. And they just don't build muscle or strength as effectively as free weights. And you know, back to throwing away the scale thing. Here's what I loved about training skinny fat people. I would I would convince them to not weigh themselves, right? Mm -hmm. I'd train them for six months. I'd get their strength to go through the roof. Because of course you take someone like that and they're gonna their p potential for strength gain is incredible. It's explosive. Then I'd have them weigh themselves, and they'd freak out. Oh, my God, I gained five pounds. I'd be like, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. How do your clothes fit? Yeah. How does it uh, – actually, my clothes fit the same or a little looser. How is that possible? Well, muscle is very dense. Body fat is less dense. Gaining five pounds of muscle <laughs> and losing 10 pounds less of body fat. Less fluffy and squishy. That's the Let's thing. That way. When you're skinny fat, your, your, your weight on the scale might not even change, or it may go up as you get leaner. As your body fat percentage goes down, the scale might actually go up because you're gaining some muscle. And as you gain muscle, of course, the overall body fat on your body makes up a smaller percentage uh, of your body weight. So lift weights, focus on compound movements, two to three days a week of full body working out, and get stronger. Well, to that point also, so I think you actually have to get this person's focus on actually I don't want you to lose any weight. Even if your goal was coming to me and you have a high body fat percentage and you're like, oh, we obviously need to lose body fat, I don't want the scale to ever go down. It's Our goal is either maintaining or increasing because I know if we're maintaining and we're, we're lifting weights, then you have a, a beautiful exchange. Which that's the perfect world, right? Can I keep 
this client's scale weight, which is completely fine. We know already, but we know their body fat percentage is off. Can I keep their weight about the same, but build a bunch of muscle? That's a perfect world. That means I'm adding a pound of muscle. I'm losing a pound of body fat. I'm adding a pound of muscle. I'm losing a pound of body fat. And they're kind of hovering the same. That's the most, the, the perfect scenario. The next best scenario is uh, we add we add three to five pounds of scale, but they added four or five pounds of muscle and they've lost two, two pounds of fat. That's a great ratio still. I'm still getting leaner and they're adding more uh, lean body mass to their frame. The scale went up a little bit, but that's okay. That's the second base. The worst scenario is to see the scale drop down. Yeah, and, then, that, and that's another thing that I remember having this client yeah. having to communicate that. Yes, I know that we just did your body fat. Yes, I know it said that you were at 30 something percent and you want to be leaner. But what I'm telling you is we don't want to see that scale go down. Because they'll get excited about that most of the time. A lot of times they do. Yeah. And so you have to communicate that. Our goal is either to maintain the scale or actually increase it mm -hmm. because the, our main objective is to build lean body mass. Yeah, and in fact, if they did weigh themselves, I would weigh them and I wouldn't let them look just so I can monitor right. the weight with the percentage. But again, don't weigh yourself. If you're getting stronger in the gym consistently, you're moving in the right direction as far as your workouts are concerned. Uh, the second... Thing you can do to remedy being skinny fat is to eat more protein. It was like time and time again when I would get a client that was in this category and I would have them track their food, they would eat ridiculously low amounts of protein. Like mm -hmm. they would have like 30 grams for the whole day and it was like one meal that had protein. The rest of the, the, the meals were all carbohydrates and maybe fat. There was no protein. Protein is connected to muscle mass. Higher amounts of protein tend to equate to more muscle, especially in combination with resistance training. When you are lifting weights, a higher protein diet means you're going to build more muscle. Now, how much is a decent amount of protein for this? Anywhere between half a gram to one gram per pound of body weight. Okay, So within that range, you're, you're eating a good amount of protein. So if you're a 130-pound uh, individual... 75 to 130 grams of protein are going to be adequate to build muscle. Any more than that, probably not necessary. Which I want to stress how difficult that is. Um, yeah, let's talk the, about what that looks like. It is. And so it, something that a lot of people don't know, when you go out and you eat a chicken salad or you go through Chipotle or you order a, a, a meal that is considered a protein meal, right? It has a meat involved in it. Most places, the, the serving size is four ounces. Four ounces. So how many grams of protein? Like 18 grams. Okay. So if you even if you ate out three times in the day and all of them you had you know chicken salad or a steak bowl or you and you ordered out like that and you think oh man I, I'm eating protein every meal I'm doing good do that four ounces four ounces four ounces you're not getting you're getting twelve ounces of protein do the math on what that is you're talking about fifty grams yeah, sixty, 60 grams yeah. of protein that's and that, that what that is good if that's three meals all of them that have a, a meat involved most people would think that they're eating. And they're eating enough protein to get by and be healthy. Like you can be, you can be considered quote unquote healthy and eating that amount of protein. But if you're trying to build muscle, which is what we need to do for this person who is skinny fat, you definitely are going to be needing more protein in that. And so, and Danny did a really good video uh, on our YouTube channel recently about this. And I, and I really liked how, how he presented it because it does remind me when I was training clients on how I'd communicate this. And the first thing that we would focus on is obviously a goal of calorie target. I need your your calories to be somewhere in this range, and that's the, the easiest place to start. The next place that we would go as far as in, in teaching and educating them is protein. It would be like, okay, make sure you get your calorie intake, and then make sure you get this protein. That would be the thing that I would have to communicate First, we'll get to the pro, we'll get to the carbs, we'll get to the fat, and I'll educate around that, and we'll work on that. But if you could at least hit where you need to hit calorie wise, and hit your protein intake, I need you to. That in itself will do wonders for us in in the pursuit of building muscle. Yeah, what, what Adam just mentioned with the you know four ounces of pro, of meat three times a day, sixty grams roughly, fifty six to sixty grams of protein. That would be good for a one hundred pound person. Literally, that's about a half a gram. Uh, that's between the range I gave you, about half a gram to a gram of protein. Yeah, nobody's 100 pounds. Yeah, so if you're listening, you're 100 pounds uh, <laughs> and you're skinny fat, then that's it. Then you're good with that. But if you're 130 pounds, 150 pounds, 160 pounds, if you're a 160-pound skinny fat male, yeah, you, you should eat some more meat. You should probably be aiming for between, you know, like I said, 80 at the low end to about 160 grams uh, of protein every single day. 
this is where protein powders can actually make a big difference. If you're not used to eating that much, now for me, it's not that big of a deal. I love protein. I've been aiming for a high protein diet for you know a long time. I started lifting weights when I was 14. Most of my meals contain a decent amount of protein. But if you're if you're if you're the kind of person that doesn't eat barely any protein most of the time, and you're skinny fat, going from eating 30 grams of protein a day to now you got to eat 80 grams of protein a day, it's going to be daunting and difficult, and it's going to require some planning. This is where protein powders can actually become very beneficial. With somebody like that, uh, there's two directions you can go. Now, one direction is better than the other, but they're both okay. Option one, increase your protein intake. Just eat more food that has protein. Track it. So instead of eating 30 grams of protein a day, I want you to eat 80 grams of protein a day. That means you're going to need to eat an additional maybe 16 ounces or more of lean meats or, or, or like steak or, or chicken. The other option is to eat as you've been eating, but take two or three servings of protein powder to make up the difference. Now, it's always ideal to have food. We always recommend real food. It's the best uh, ever. But if that's difficult for you, because if you're going from you know, a, a grand total of three or four ounces of meat a day to 20 plus ounces of meat a day, that's a lot for mm-hmm. some people. And it's hard to get used to for some people. Protein's also very satiating. So you start eating that and you start finding like, oh, I can't do it. I got to get used to it. Protein powders can be extremely valuable in this case. In fact, now that I think about it, the clients that I recommended protein powders to the most were my skinny fat clients. Yes, because Even- there's a massive deficiency there. Yep. Even more so than my hard gainer clients. Like yeah. hard gainers would be just skinny, skinny, not skinny fat, but just skinny, skinny in particular males. Typically for them, it wasn't hard to get them to eat more protein. Like, okay, I'll do whatever. I'll eat it. Skinny fat's like, oh, I don't like meat. I don't like the taste of protein. Uh, it doesn't feel good. I've only, you know, I'm not used to this or whatever. And I'd say, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. You know, uh, in the morning, have a protein shake with your breakfast. At lunch, have another one and then see where we're at and maybe add a third one. Well, this was a little area of contention for us when we first started the podcast. I remember we used to have these debates back and forth. And I kind of sided with the the, the protein powder uh, more often. And not because I'm pro-protein powder. It was because I found it really difficult personally and with a lot of clients that I had to get the protein intake that they they needed. It's just, and I, I don't know if that's because you come from a family that centered a lot of the meals around meat, and I come from a family that ate a lot of processed and sugar and carbs. And so for me, it, it, it's been a uh, behavioral thing that I've had to try and change my entire life. But I've always struggled with hitting enough. I mean, I'm a 220 pound guy. So I'm, I'm wanting to be minimum 180 to 200 grams of protein. And when you figure out a a six ounce chicken breast is only 35 grams of protein, do the math. You know, how many people can honestly say they consistently eat five to six chicken breasts a day? If you're my size, right? If you're my, that's obviously it's all relative to your size, but that's a, that's a, that was a lot for me. And then even for my clients that were 130 or 150 pounds or 180 pounds, you know, so they're not eating five or six chicken breasts. They need three or four. But how many people really do that every day? Most mm-hmm. people, dinner maybe, or maybe at their lunch meal, they get one or two like really good protein-heavy meals. Mm-hmm. The rest, I mean, breakfast is like a total carb-heavy uh, meal, period. Most people are gravitating towards the the quick carbs for, for breakfast if time. If they do have protein, it's two eggs. Right. And then, yeah. and, and exactly, right, which is nothing. And then lunchtime, you're going deli meats and, and sandwiches, which I told you guys, if you're eating out any – you know, Togo's sandwich place, it's four ounces. That's how much, four ounces or less. Sometimes it's two ounces. If it's a sandwich and it's like a Eric's Deli or like a regular sandwich, two ounces. If it's a big, massive sub, it's normally four ounces. So you got to ask for double meat just to even be able yeah. to get a decent protein intake. It takes a lot of planning. Yeah. And I mean, I and I think too, initially we were just like trying to, you know, pull back the reins a little bit from the magical idea that protein solves everything. But uh, we were speaking more towards the bodybuilding community. And so that, that was one where we see it, it pervaded and distorted a bit in that direction. But, you know, as your average person, you're right. I think that it is a good it is a good point to, to point out that it, it's very challenging uh, for your average person to incorporate as much adequate protein as they need. Well, there, there's been this misconception too around like my clients that don't have a lot of uh, education around protein powders, 
think that protein powders build muscle. It's not protein powders don't build muscle. They supplement something that you're lacking potentially in. And so, right. of course, the uh, the Your ideal body needs to be healthy to build muscle. Uh, obviously, the ideal place is whole foods. Always, if I had a and if I have a client that can get their 150 grams to 200 grams of protein from all whole foods every day, I am fucking winning. But when I'm honest with myself, that's probably less than 10 percent of my clientele could ever do that. Most of them had to use tools like protein powders to try and supplement it to hit that target. Unless, again, like your point, Justin, we're talking to the bodybuilding community. If we're talking to the bodybuilding community, which is no longer the majority of our audience, no, no. to me, that's a very small percentage of our audience. And they're not the skinny fat. That right, we're exactly. Right. The bodybuilding community needs to, to lay off the protein powders and bars. They fucking overdo it. 300 grams of protein is ridiculous for most people. You're way overdoing it. It's not magical like that. And you're already probably prepping, meal prepping and carrying your six-pack bags around and hitting your protein intake. It's a total fucking waste of money. And you're also probably eating BCAs, which is another waste of money. So those people, yes. But the majority, my average Jane or Joe that, you know, they're, they're not big into lifting weights. They're, they're here to come, hey, Adam, I'm oh, I, my doctor told me I need to get in here and start working out. Where do I start? What do I do? And we start addressing nutrition. Almost always those clients you know, grossly mm -hmm. under eat protein. Mm -hmm. And I had to find ways if I couldn't get them to eat it all naturally to supplement if we right, had to. Right, right. And you combine it with weight training, with resistance training, it's a beautiful, perfect storm for muscle building, which will help reverse this skinny fat condition uh, that you may be finding yourself in. Now that brings me to, to the other macros, fats and carbohydrates. Now here's the deal. They're not directly related to muscle growth like protein is. However, if your carbohydrates are low too low or your fats are too low, they will also inhibit your body's ability to build muscle. Oh, mess with your hormones. They can both they can mess with your hormones. Fat is an essential macronutrient. If that's too low, you're just not going to be healthy. Yeah. You can get away with having zero carbs, but zero carbs is not an optimal state to build muscle. This has been proven it's not time the greatest and time. for performance. Yeah, either. time and time. Yeah, it's not the greatest for strength. It's not the so you want to have all of them. So what I mean by that, and the reason why I'm saying this is if you're like if you're skinny fat because you're worried about being overweight what you may find yourself doing is increasing your protein and cutting everything, cutting carbs way down. Like, okay, well, I'm bumping up my proteins, but I'm going to cut my carbs way down. No, no, no. You want to eat an adequate amount of calories and make sure you get all of the macronutrients. I'm just saying, we're just saying, aim for about half to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. The other two, not as important that you hit particular numbers, but you still want them to be relatively balanced. The third way you can help remedy skinny fat, and this is just, I found this to be super common with, remember how I categorized skinny fat, the my skinny fat clients into the super listless, tired, and the high strung, I'm too busy. Yeah. The high strung, too busy type of individual really did a terrible job with this next one, which is sleep mm. and stress management. Lack of sleep and poor stress management is a is a wonderful recipe for muscle loss and fat gain. Because if you when you lack lots of sleep, which la lack of sleep is a is a stress on the body. Lack of sleep, your body thinks we're not in a good situation. Stress sends the same signal. We're not in a good situation. When your body feels like it's in a not good situation, it ramps up its ability to store body fat. Because remember, stored body fat is a safety mechanism. It's stored mm -hmm. energy, and it tries to reduce muscle because it wants to reduce the amount of energy that you need. To stay alive, so it makes you low a lower calorie, fatter machine is essentially what it does. Not to mention being malnourished <clears throat> is a stress. Mm -hmm. Not feeding your body what it needs is a stress too. So if you're somebody who's already not giving your body the nutrients it needs, and then in addition to that you lack sleep and you have a high stressful job, and I again th that's the common this person that fits in this category tends to be that I'm uh, afraid of lifting weights. I don't want to get all big and bulky. Um, I eat very l low calories, so my body's not getting very uh, very much nutrients. I have a high stressful job. I don't sleep very well. It's like the perfect storm for that person. And I think we we forget that just because exercise feels good, that it also can be a stress. And these are also the people that tend to like to when they do exercise 
hammer the shit out of their body or do long endurance. Well, all the benefits stuff. of exercise come after the recovery process. And mm. If you're eliminating out the recovery process or you're getting in the way of that by like introducing, you know, you're not getting enough sleep or you keep introducing all these other activities in between, you know, your body's just going to keep spinning the wheels and it's just never going to really reap the benefits of what you set out for. Poor sleep promotes fat storage uh, through and muscle loss through a couple different ways. One, it promotes it through the hormonal changes that happen in the body. Poor, poor sleep and, and poor stress management elevates stress hormones, and it lowers anabolic or muscle-building hormones. Now, why does it do that? Stress hormones provide you with a short-term amount of energy. So it's, not, it's like cortisol, for example. Cortisol is known as a stress hormone, right? Nothing in inherently wrong with cortisol. You need it. In fact, if you had no cortisol, you wouldn't be very healthy. But when cortisol is up and high, it gives you more energy to do what you need to do. So if you're lacking sleep, your body's trying to make up for that by pumping up and boosting up these stress hormones. But these stress hormones are also terrible for muscle building. They tend to, they tend to not want to allow your body to build muscle. And your anabolic muscle building hormones, like in men, testosterone, start to drop. Growth hormone, which is also considered a you know a part of the anabolic hormone uh, you know, category, starts to lower as well. The other way that it promotes body fat gain is through behavioral change. So when you're stressed out and not getting good sleep. Craving those bad foods. Your cravings start to change. Now, either because you're trying to self-medicate because you feel bad, so you want to eat the food that makes you feel good, which tends to be the candies and the cookies and the hyperpalatable types of foods, and or it may also be the serotonin boosting effects of certain sugary type of foods. Now, that one... I believe a little less in, although some scientists have made some cases for that. I tend to believe it's the it's the former. It's the I don't feel good, and you know how we you know what we do when we don't feel good. We tend to want to remedy that with a substance, um, and it often tends to be food. This is why people eat when they're sad mm -hmm. or stressed out. Why they eat certain types of foods. This happens with lack of sleep as well. Lack of sleep has been tied to excessive fat gain or high body fat percentages in numerous studies. I also think that th this is the, the reason, too, why we recommend a training pro protocol of only two to three times a week full body. Because mm -hmm. this person, too, who's dealing with a ton of stress, you've got to be careful. Again, the, the workout part is also stress. And if you're trying to reduce that, one of the better ways of doing is, you know, pick the two days of the week when you're the most rested. You know, don't don't train. Take the day off when you you're up at four o'clock in the morning and you know it's a long day at work for twelve hours and you're and you've been stressed. All day. Don't make that day to be the day that you go in the gym and, and hammer it out. Pick a day when you're well rested to go in there and actually train. And so learning to know how to navigate your week like that and and, and understand that okay, how much stress did I take on today? Is this a day that I go to the gym? Okay, it's not. Tomorrow I'll go when I have a lot less stress and get better sleep. Yep. Now number one, I would say reduce um, and then eventually eliminate your intake of stimulant uh, type uh, products. Caffeine in particular. Caffeine is a strong stimulant. Skinny fat people who fall in this category of not getting enough sleep tend to have and a lot of caffeine for obvious reasons. You're tired. Mm -hmm. You want to get through your day. You're going to have more caffeine, which then makes it harder for you to sleep or at least reduces the quality of your sleep, which then makes you tired and kind of perpetuates itself. So strongly recommend reducing caffeine intake and eventually eliminating it, both to help you sleep more, but also caffeine. When you throw caffeine on a body that is low muscle, high body fat, low body weight, undernourished, too much stress, caffeine actually becomes a muscle burner. It'd be, it, caffeine can actually reduce your body's ability to build muscle. So slowly reduce your caffeine. You don't want to go through the withdrawal of caffeine, which can be pretty nasty. If you've ever, anybody who's ever had caffeine on a daily basis and cut it out cold turkey knows what I'm talking about. It's terrible. I recommend cutting your caffeine intake by a quarter every week. So at the end of four weeks, you should be down to zero. So if you have two cups of coffee a day, then the you know first week it's cut it down by a quarter. Then the following week, cut it down by a quarter. By the end of the fourth week, you should be down to zero uh, and allow your body uh, to acclimate. That will also improve your sleep quality. The second thing I would say is to Make sure the place, the place that you're sleeping is cool and dark. Uh, that makes a big difference. And allocate seven to nine hours of sleep. So make sure you give yourself that amount of time. So say to your – very few people do this. They say, okay, I, want, I, I wake up every morning at 6 a.m. They don't go back and think, okay, how many hours – what time do I need to go to bed? Set your bedtime 
and be solid about it. So if you're waking up at you know 5 a.m., that probably means you need to be in bed by 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. Make it a solid time and then treat that time seriously by creating a sleep routine, which this is something that um, I started incorporating later on in my life and I find this to be totally invaluable. Now, a sleep routine is just kind of like a warm up before my workout, right? It's, it's kind of like your morning routine. We totally. all have those. You know, we all brush our teeth, shower, make the bed. We it's so funny that yeah, we, we have hope. this crazy morning routine and but ironically, you'll benefit more from having a evening routine than you probably ever will from having a morning routine. Oh, totally. It's like we expect ourselves to just jump into bed and go to sleep, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're with the kids, the TV's on, you're you're on your computer, your 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 iPhone yeah, you just or whatever. Need to shut your eyes. Yeah, and then you just oh, I'm oh, time to go to bed. Turn everything turn all the bright lights off and let's just go straight to bed. Doesn't work that way. The the way our bodies evolved was why by the sun slowly setting, so our brain perceives less and less light. It starts to pre prepare itself for sleep. We're probably doing less of the stressful stuff at night. Humans, we're not nocturnal animals. We don't see very well at night. So for most of human history, when it got dark, we stopped roaming around. We stopped running around and hunting and stuff. We kind of hung around the, the fire and then we got ready for sleep. So uh, a sleep routine is extremely important for modern times. So what I like to tell people to do is about one to two hours before uh, it's time for you to go to bed, shut off your lights, um, use candlelight or use dim lights or, or wear blue light blocking glasses. Blue light blocking glasses prevent the type of light that comes from electronics that tends to tell the brain the most, more than other forms of light, to, that the sun is out, so you need to be really awake. Do that about one to two hours before you go to bed. Don't be on electronics. That makes such a big difference. It sounds so silly, but it makes a tremendous difference to the point now where I do, if I miss that, if I miss that sleep routine, I could tell dramatically uh, the difference in the, in the quality of my sleep. And studies show the melatonin production explodes uh, when people wear, just wear blue light blocking glasses. Don't even turn off electronics. They just put on glasses that block this light. But I recommend turning off electronics. That seems to be the best for me, mm. uh, you know, in, in, in those sense. Um, I said cool, dark room. Um, there are products you can use to make sure that your mattress stays cool, or I recommend opening a window or using air conditioning. Temperature of your body makes a massive difference on your sleep quality. And the hours that you need to sleep is about seven to nine. Some people are okay with seven. Most people do better with eight to nine hours of sleep. So do those things and watch your body change. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides and resources. They're all totally free. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal and Adam at mindpumpadam.